So hey there everyone, um, I'm Ainsley, um, and I'm here to kind of talk to you guys about uh, protocol buffers and how we use them at the company that I work at called Improbable, um, and how they kind of form the foundation of our development strategy. Um, so as I said, I work at a company called Improbable, uh, and the screen is not updating. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I work at a startup in London called Improbable. Um, we are a company of about 200 people, and we build a platform for people to build large-scale distributed simulations on. Uh, there we go. Cool. Um, so we have offices in both London and San Francisco, and um, we build a product which is called Spatial OS. And Spatial OS is a uh, platform as a service which allows people to run these massive scale simulations in the cloud. So we allow people to define these things called workers, which are pieces of code that describe how your simulation should behave in a given uh, region of space. And we let you write those in, in kind of most of the languages that you're comfortable in. And then it's our job to take those pieces of code and run them in the cloud across a bunch of different machines and stitch that back together so that you feel like you're, you're running uh, one seamless simulation. Um, if you're trying to simulate a game world, if you're trying to build a video game, we also provide direct integrations uh, with a bunch of game engines that people use. So we provide integrations with Unity and Unreal Engine. Um, and just like an example of some of the cool stuff that people um, are building now on top of Spatial OS that you can actually go out and play with. So there's a Worlds Adrift, which is built by Bossa Studios. It's currently in early access on Steam, and it's uh, just a huge, large-scale, persistent MMO um, in which you can kind of fly and build these skyships between different islands um, and kind of discover uh, lost technology. And it has a really interesting um, ecosystem because the world is so large and persistent. Um, there's Lazarus, which is a, a different take on the same idea. So once again, large, persistent world, but this time it's a top-down uh, 2D shooter that you can join and play around in. Um, and it's really cool because it was built by just four people on top of our platform. Uh, they didn't have to know anything about netcode or, or kind of state synchronization. We handle that for them. Um, and then it's not all video games that we do um, as well. So the exact same platform that people use to run these large scale video game worlds, uh, we actually allow kind of governments and companies to run large scale simulations of cities or infrastructure. Um, so we've done work with the British government on um, building a large, uh, a large simulation of the internet backbone. Uh, so all the routers and BGP and stuff, and allowing them to kind of probe that and see um, if kind of any interesting cascading effects happen when routes go down. Um, and also build full-on simulations of a city with the power network, water network, um, and road network, and see how, you know, say, a burst water main in one area can cause a traffic jam in a completely different part of the city. Um, and so the question is, is how do we kind of build this platform? Um, what goes into making a platform in which you can run these massive, massive simulations in the cloud? Um, so there are loads and loads of different teams at Improbable, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to talk about the interactions between uh, these three kind of teams. Uh, first team is the worker integration team. They are one of the teams which are closest to our customers, and so it's their job to provide a SDK which people can use to build these workers. Um, so they have to provide a kind of stable API and language bindings uh, for a bunch of common languages. So at the moment, they support Java, C++, C Sharp, and also JavaScript and TypeScript workers as well. Um, it's the job of the worker integration team to build the kind of um, interface between the workers that users write and Fabric, which is the runtime of our simulations. So Fabric's job is to kind of track all the individual entities, uh, track which machine has authority over the entity, um, and deal with the state manipulation um, and just keep the kind of uh, coherent simulation going. So it's literally their job to kind of make the, the fabric of the space-time of these virtual worlds uh, so that people don't really have to worry about what's going on underneath. They can just um, update individual entities um, regardless. And then Fabric talks to the team that I work on at Improbable. Um, we're infrastructure, and so it's our job to actually um, run and maintain the virtual machines on which the simulations run. Um, and also provide a bunch of APIs, so logging and um, monitoring and authentication so that people can run their simulations. And so we write a bunch of our code in Go, and Fabric is written in Java. And so we have all of these different languages that we have to support, um, and we also have to support 
uh, pretty much arbitrary user code um, talking to a bunch of the different APIs in our system, and we wanted to figure out, you know, how do we tie all this stuff together? Um, and like most companies, uh, when Improbable was founded, so the company was founded about five years ago, we, gen we went down the kind of regular JSON plus REST API route. So we exposed standard REST APIs over HTTP, and they returned uh, JSON responses to our users. And we've all kind of seen the body of a JSON response before, um, but it didn't work perfectly for us. So um, just a few uh, reasons why it wasn't that great for us. Uh, JSON objects aren't typed uh, necessarily. And at Improbable, all the languages that we use um, in, inside of our company and all the languages that we expose SDKs for are strongly typed. And it can be quite clunky to deal with JSON inside of these languages. And we really hated the idea of losing that type safety in between the interaction between our services because the platform that we build is built up of a bunch of different services and a bunch of user code. Um, and we really ideally want to know at compile time whether or not we're interacting with the service properly. Um, this also was an issue whilst the company was moving extremely fast, our APIs were changing rapidly. And sometimes you know, we realized that we gave a field a terrible name in the API. And, Changing that in the JSON API is, is disastrous for all clients, um, unless you, you kind of version your API, but then you have to convince people to move over to a new version, uh, which you don't necessarily want to do. Also, it's undocumented by default and kind of schemaless by default as well, which can be a, a, a massive pro and also a, um, a really uh, annoying thing. And if you have a bunch of different teams in the company and they're all trying to move really fast and really independently, it's quite hard. Um, to communicate exactly what APIs your team exposes and exactly what the structures that those APIs are supposed to uh, return. And bar just you know, using Postman and firing off requests at uh, REST endpoints, there was no easy way in the company for us to, to really have a canonical state to say, like, this is the state of this API, and this is what it's supposed to return. Um, any of the documentation that we did have would slowly drift out of synchronization with the real world. And we didn't invest time in building the tooling to, to kind of automatically generate that documentation. And the last thing we had an issue with was streaming data. So uh, we want people to interact with these simulations. These simulations are, are living things, um, which means that we constantly have to stream data to clients. And also, we generally speaking want bi-directional communication as well. Clients want to be able to interact with the simulations as they're running. And there's no real easy way to do that um, with a REST API. You can, you can kind of roll your own things. You can use polling if you want to, to kind of uh, periodically get updates or, or long polling or something. Um, but yeah, there's no canonical way of doing this, and having a bunch of different teams within your company decide to implement this in their own way can also be uh, a pretty bad way to, to grow a code base. And so we kind of looked at uh, Protobuf and gRPC, and the main reason is because a bunch of the people that I work with in Improbable and a bunch of people that were hired early on in the company's history uh, are engineers from Google. And Protobuf and gRPC really do form the backbone of how development happens at Google. And so um, the proposal was kind of made that all of our services should speak uh, to each other via protocol buffers and expose APIs via gRPC, and that we should start by defining the kind of structures and APIs first and then go into implementation. And then the proto file would be kind of the, the source of truth um, when it comes to what, what an API looks like. And so just a quick primer if you guys missed the talk yesterday on code for protocol buffers or you've never seen them before. Um, so protocol buffers are Google's um, just language neutral and platform neutral mechanism for uh, serializing and deserializing structured data. So you describe your, uh, the, the piece of data that you're trying to seri uh, serialize in a schema, and then there's a thing called the proto compiler, which will turn that schema into generated code for all of the languages that you're trying to target. And typically speaking, that code will be kind of idiomatic. So um, if someone's just used to writing code in that language, they should be able to interact with your APIs fairly easily but you don't have to kind of write all of those clients yourself. Um, and it just so happens that the proto compiler targets all the languages that we really care about at Improbable, uh, be it Java, Go, uh, C++, and C Sharp. Um, and so what does a, a proto message look like? Well, you pretty much just give your message a name. Messages can have fields, types, and identifiers, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and, and that's it. And then you pass that message through to the proto compiler, and it will generate out code for your given language of choice. So um, in Go, it will generate out struct that looks kind of like this. And then it will also attach a bunch of methods to that struct to let you do uh, serialization and deserialization 
Um, if you write TypeScript, maybe it will generate out something that looks like this. Um, this comes out of our own uh, TypeScript compiler. And what did this give us? Well, it gave us static typing where it was possible. So as I said, we use uh, a bunch of uh, strongly typed language languages at Improbable, and it just generates out the code directly. There's no magic, there's no runtime, um, yeah, runtime magic that goes on, no reflection. And this means that we have compile time safety um, in uh, knowing that the interactions between our APIs are actually safe. Um, it also means that there's no special support required for IDEs, um, just because it's just code that's checked in like any other code. Uh, your IDE can pick that up straight away um, and autocomplete will work, which really, really helps people discover methods an API exposes or data that uh, they can access from a struct very, very easily. Uh, a proto is self-documenting. So you just open up the .proto file and you have a look at the message and you can see exactly what fields it's supposed to have. Uh, you can actually add comments to your proto file so you can say you know, when you should use a field, when you shouldn't. Um, you can add different markers to the different fields in a message as well uh, to describe extra behavior about those. We'll talk about that a bit more later. But it, it basically just means that um, there is this one canonical pace in our repository where every single uh, data structure that we use to communicate between services lives. And that's really, really powerful if someone just joins the company and they, they want to know how things talk to each other. You just point them at one place, and there it is. And the other thing is you also have a structured representation of your structured data, which is really cool because you can pass all of that information and then generate out um, you know, pretty documentation or a command line tool that lets people, say, search through all the different APIs that a team might expose. You can just build that because you have a place that stores every single uh, structure that you use to talk between teams. And finally, backwards and forwards uh, compatibility. So as I said before, there's those, there are those IDs um, at the end of each field in your proto message, and the ID is actually the only important thing in that message. The names are just there for the convenience of, of the humans. So if you wanted to rename a field, so for example, if you wanted to rename author to author name and then embed a struct, um, you can do that, you can extend the message, and all old clients will still be able to deserialize the message as they knew it before because the IDs haven't changed, but new clients uh, that you've built out will understand the new fields that you've added as well. Um, and the renaming of the field actually doesn't affect anything, um, which obviously you'll have to change the code when you build it, um, but the, the wire protocol doesn't change between these services. And that's a, a really, really powerful thing if you're trying to move quickly as a company and you're willing to accept that you're going to make mistakes when you, when you name things and when you develop services. Um, the other thing is when you, de uh, when you deprecate a field, uh, you can remove it, and then you can also mark the ID as, as kind of reserved or used. Um, and so you can uh, deprecate things kind of slowly, uh, and whenever you're, you're certain that there are no more consumers of that part of your API, you can just mark a field as reserved, uh, remove it, and no one else will reuse that ID in future. So that's how we serialize the data that, uh, between our services, but how do they actually communicate with each other? And that's uh, where we use gRPC, which is kind of the the rest part of that, that uh, or the, re the replacement for the rest part of our APIs. Uh, so gRPC is um, the method which we use. So it's, it's, proto it's proto buff uh, protocol buffer based. And what happens is the proto compiler now, instead of generating out just data structures and martial and unmartial methods, it generates out an interface for your server that you can implement in whatever language. So in this case, it would be C++, but you can do it in Golang or Java. Um, and then it will also generate out client stubs or uh, clients, um, which will be able to talk directly to the service that you've implemented. And it really doesn't matter what language you decide to write your server in or what language your clients are in, they'll all communicate exactly the same and you'll have these great code generated clients um, that you can use. And so what do you do to, to make one of these services? Well, you just define it in the proto file the same way that you define a message. Instead, you now use the service keyword, and then you can define the methods that that service exposes. So uh, you could have the get book method, which returns a single book, or a query books, which returns a, a stream of books. Um, and then at the end of that, in Golang, for example, you'll end up with a client uh, like this, or perhaps an interface for a server that you need to implement and then bind um, to your gRPC server in order to expose it over the internet. Um, and this is, this is great for us. Um, it gives us a really, really low overhead uh, mechanism for talking between our services. So um, protos are extremely fast to serialize and deserialize because um, they're not designed to be human readable. The, the actual definition itself is supposed to be read by, read by humans, but when it's two machines talking to each other, they don't need to you know, pass around strings or anything. Um, it makes great use of HTTP2, so you can actually send multiple requests um, over the same connection. Um, 
And that just gives us you know, the, the ability to have really, really efficient communication, communication between our services. And two, um, as I showed you in that, in that service that we defined, it gives us streaming responses and also the option for bidirectional communication. Um, which means that if we want to stream updates from, say, a running simulation, uh, we can do that and we don't have to implement that ourselves. I've kind of neglected uh, talking about browsers. I mentioned that you can technically have uh, JavaScript and TypeScript compiled, uh, yeah, code compiled out from your proto compiler, um, but, and we need to do that. So we actually give people this tool. This is called the inspector. You can go on the website, the improbable website, after you've launched a simulation and you can watch your simulation from top down view and see all the different entities and all the different um, components that make up your simulation in their current state and time. And this needs to talk directly to the code that's running your simulation. And the question is, how do you stream that data from your simulation to the browser? And so previously, there was this kind of tool called gRPC Gateway, um, which, once again, it's a code generation tool that generates out a REST API that backs onto um, your Proto API. And so it will code generate out the, the GRP service, gRPC service as you're used to, and it will also generate out this reverse proxy, which will speak uh, REST and HTTP, take in requests, translate them into gRPC requests, and then send that back in the other direction. Um, this is fine, but it kind of breaks a couple of the rules of Proto that we've come uh, used to and improbable. And so one thing is, you know, once things go out into the REST world, you lose all that uh, type safety that you wanted to. Uh, the clients aren't auto-generated. You kind of hand roll them yourself. So you roll these JSON requests, um, and, or, or you roll these requests, and then you get back these JSON responses that you have to deal with yourself. And the other thing is, as you can see in this diagram, in the JSON responses, um, because they're supposed to be kind of consumed by humans, uh, you can see that we're starting to use the field names again, and that's not something which we want to necessarily do. So uh, at Improbable, we just recently open sourced this as of about a month ago. Uh, we've been working in collaboration with a team at Google themselves and also internally, we've been talking to them and we released gRPC Web, which actually allows you to uh, generate out both code on the server side and on the client side that lets you talk directly from the browser via gRPC um, to your backend services. And this supports everything that you're used to. So HTTP2, so you can actually multiplex uh, requests over the same connection. And also um, it supports uh, streaming as well, just the same way you would in regular gRPC clients. Um, additionally, it comes with a TypeScript proto compiler. So now you can generate out clients as you normally would uh, expect a proto compiler to do to uh, you know, have all the kind of great auto completion type safety stuff that you get when you use any other language. You can use TypeScript. So now you don't have to handcraft kind of your own call objects to the API that's all handled for you and all, all requests and all responses are now uh, typed all over again. So the last thing I kind of mentioned when I, when I talked about you know, why we chose protobuf protocol buffers is the fact that they're extensible. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, the protocol buffer compi compiler has a, a very pluggable architecture. And so the language support that you actually see already for, for Go, Java, C++, uh, JavaScript, and TypeScript is a are actually all proto plugins themselves. But there's nothing to stop you from writing your own proto plugins, which is what we do at Improbable to kind of get rid of a bunch of repetitive uh, kind of menial tasks out of our development flow. And so how it works is the proto compiler is kind of the thing that you invoke from the command line, and it will invoke a plugin, which is just a binary on your machine, which takes in a code generator request and gives you back a code generator response. Um, and a code generator request is literally a proto which describes the protos in the file uh, that someone is trying to compile, and the code generator Generator response is pretty much just the code that your plugin has decided to generate. Um, and so a code generator request looks a little bit like that. So it will tell you the files uh, that you need to generate and the description of all of those files. And then it's up to you. You can, uh, you can literally build anything that you want as long as you've described, uh, you have the sufficient information in your, in your proto file. So one of the things that we built in Probable are called proto validators, uh, which are really, really useful. So we found that um, it's great having type safety when you build an API, but actually, generally speaking, you want to have more constraints on the data that you give, uh, that you take in, or that you return, than just it is of this type. 
Um, so we found ourselves hand rolling a lot of validation code just for really, really simple things like, you know, make sure the integer is in this range or make sure the string matches this regular expression. And you'd have to implement this on both the client and the server, and that's just uh, a massive waste of engineering time, and it gives opportunities for those things to become out of sync. So we decided to promote the validation aspect of things up into the proto message themselves. So options are the things that come at the end of a field, and you can kind of arbitrarily define these things. And all you do is now you attach to a piece of information uh, any validators that you want to attach to it. So these are just simple ones like integers less than or float is greater than, but then you can also do you know message exists, like is not nil, uh, strings not empty, and all those kind of things. And you can just define them in the proto message alongside your data, and then our code uh, or our code generator will actually spit out the methods that you need to validate that information. And this just keeps that validation code all in one place and it makes discoverability really easy. You just open the proto file as you normally would and then you instantly know which fields are there and also what the constraints are on that field. And you also don't have to implement the checking for that yourself. Um, these methods are automatically called whenever a request comes in over our gRPC interface. Um, and if you are building your own custom client, all you have to do is fire off this validate method and check the response. Now, I named my talk Protobuf all the way down because um, we really do take the kind of um, the protocol buffer method to development very, very seriously and improbable. And I've kind of given a coherent story of how our clients talk to our services and how our services talk to our services. Um, but there's one thing that's, I guess, missing from the picture to truly have protocol buffers all the way down, which is how do you do persistence of your information? Um, and so just for a very, very quick context, when I joined Improbable, we were heavy users of Google's cloud data store, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone else do, but, um, but we had a bunch of code that depended directly on the weird quirks of, of this kind of NoSQL database that Google exposed. Um, and it led to these subtle and not so subtle bugs appearing in production and it was starting to affect our users. So we wanted to, at a minimum, abstract away that from our engineers, so we didn't want them to have to learn the weird quirks of Google Data Store. But ideally, we wanted to give ourselves the option of moving away from Data Store in future if we wanted to. And so we needed to, to kind of rethink our persistence layer and build a layer above um, Data Store. And so there was this kind of internal idea floating around called DB Proto, and someone had built like a very, very rough prototype, which was about saving and loading uh, protocol buffers to um, uh, NoSQL and also relational data stores as well. Um, so I kind of took this prototype and ran with it and turned it into uh, pretty much a full-blown uh, ORM, which is what we use as the foundation of our persistence at Improbable as well. Um, and so we had a few criteria that we really needed to fulfill. We needed it to be database agnostic. As I said, we didn't want to be tied to Google's data store anymore. Uh, ideally, you know, if we wanted to take our cluster and run it somewhere else that isn't on Google's infrastructure, um, we would need to be able to do that. So all new services needed to be agnostic to what database they were using on the back end. Um, we wanted to keep backwards and forwards compatibility. So that was a massive thing that Proto gave you in the first place. Um, and we wanted to try and keep as many of the semantics as regular kind of Proto serialization and deserialization as possible when we were telling people, hey, you can also kind of store these things in the database. And the last thing is that we wanted the information to be indexable. Uh, by the backend data store. So this isn't about just taking a proto, serializing it, and dumping it in a database. Uh, we actually want to use and leverage the database as much as possible, the query planner of that database and everything else. We want to be able to express all the queries that we normally would if we used um, any other system. So we really had to figure out a way to unpack the data from that proto message and put it um, into a variety of different data stores without affecting the semantics of proto or also um, whilst leveraging the power that, that data store gives you. So, so what does a, uh, a DB proto look like? Well, a DB proto looks like any other proto message, uh, apart from the fact that it has this embedded key message in it. Um, and that embedded key message uh, is used to give us type safety uh, when we actually reference objects by their key, but also used to reference other objects from other protos when we're talking about doing relations. Um, the other thing that we do is we still use those options that we have with fields. So you can use those options to say if you want to generate a getter method for a given field, or if you want to put some constraints on a field. So for example, if you have a book, the ISBN is supposed to be unique, and you want to have that uh, replicated over in your backend data store. You want to leverage, say, you know, unique fields in SQL, or, or perhaps uh, unique keys in some kind of uh, NoSQL data store. Uh, it also allows you to specify things like unique together constraints and other things that you're just used to in a regular ORM. Finally, the question is, how do you do relations with a DB proto? Well, it's just the same as 
uh, embedding a proto in another message. So in this case, this is a DB proto message for a book, and then we just add in this extra field, which is the, the author key. Um, and it's a repeated author key because a book can have more than one author. And then DB proto compiler will see that, recognize that you've done a relation, and um, it will generate out um, either a schema or code which allows you to query across that relation. And so in the end of it, what you end up with is either with, is this interface which we generate out. Uh, so this is the Golang uh, implementation of that. So you have the kind of things that you're used to in, a, um, in an ORM, so creating, getting, getting all, deleting, and updating atomically an object in your data store, and then also uh, any of the getters that you decided to generate as well. Um, it will also spit out an SQL schema or migrations um, if you are deciding to back onto a regular SQL database. Um, and, and the great thing is that this, this interface is consistent between all our data stores. So we've kind of defined the semantics that you're supposed to expect from DB Proto, and then um, it doesn't matter which backend you decide to compile for. You can compile for SQL, you can compile for Google's data store, um, but the code above that layer really doesn't have to change. And so just as a recap, um, to kind of wrap up the talk, uh, so yeah, we managed to come up with a kind of strategy that allows us to really use protocol buffers all the way down in our stack at Improbable. So this means if you're building a game and your game client is talking um, to our, our backend services, it's going to be communicating uh, using protocol buffers uh, via our workers, our worker SDKs that we expose. Once that message reaches um, our infrastructure, once it's actually running inside of Fabric, the runtime of our simulations, Fabric is communicating with other Fabric nodes using protocol buffers. And then when Fabric has to do something, it has to uh, log a message, Fabric needs to do some authentication, Fabric has to do anything, it's going to be talking to the infrastructure team using those protocol buffers. And finally, when the infrastructure team needs to persist some information, we don't have to suddenly jump out of the protocol buffer world and into kind of language-specific or database-specific code. We can just use protos the exact same way that you're used to. So really, you can have someone new join the company and just learn one way of doing things and one paradigm. Um, and instantly they can kind of become productive. So things that we kind of learned, uh, explicit schemas are awesome. It's, it's very, very easy for someone to just jump into our code base and figure out what talks to what and exactly how it does that. Um, plugins are super, super powerful. So if there is a task that you find yourself doing in your code base that seems to be incredibly repetitive and it's something that's directly related to the data that you're operating on, uh, you have the option to just move that, um, that piece of information up into the same place you define your data and then build a plugin to, um, to generate out that piece of code for you so uh, everyone else gets the benefit of, of one person's work. And finally, it allows us to do what I see as the most important thing, which is write in any language um, and also have our users write in any language. But at the same time, everything speaks the same language and can, can communicate uh, just the same. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for your time. Um, we are hiring. If any of this stuff interests you, you can come find me afterwards or check out our website. Uh, add improbable.io, or if you want to build large-scale simulations in the cloud, go for it. It's free to check out as well. 